Okay, everybody, thanks very much for joining us. And we'll, uh, we'll fire off with our panel discussion entitled Festival War, Creating Safe Spaces, uh, which I think really um, is a great chance for us to look at the, the, an overview of um, the festival culture that I suspect many of us are familiar with, although by no means all of us would be familiar with in this, uh, in this um, area now. Uh, and then narrow that right down to um, where safe spaces fit into that sort of overall concept of, of, um, of a festival, of a, a gathering, uh, and then really try and unpick a number of, a number of ideas surrounding uh, that sort of safe space concept. And so I'm joined today by five uh, very, very well qualified uh, people to discuss the history, the current status and situation of the festival, festival or gathering movement in Australia and well beyond uh, on a number of levels and contexts, um, working with a number of different communities and in a, a number of different sort of geographical uh, regions, locations. So I think that gives us plenty of scope to, to explore the question from uh, um, from these various perspectives. So what I'd like to do is ask our panel members just to introduce uh, themselves one by one and just give us a bit of their background um, and, uh, and also perhaps give us, for a, for a start, um, their perception of the sort of the history of the festival movement um, from, their own, from their own perspective and in their own experience. Uh, and then I'd like them to uh, finish their own little exposition by where they feel we're at uh, right now. So I'll start with, with Paul uh, about if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to um, sit down from, from here on in rather than direct the panel from above, if everybody will bear with me there. And we'll, uh, we'll set off. So thanks very much, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Abad. I'm from uh, Brisbane, southeast Queensland. And... Um, I've been working in festival culture, event culture, uh, mainly focused on outdoor events since 2001. So my first uh, outdoor event was around that time. And I'm the founder and director of Earth Frequency Festival, which is coming up for its 13th year. So this has been a big big part of my life. Um, the, the evolution I've seen over that time, the first events we were doing were two, 300 people. Um, private property, most, mostly uh, based around uh, tree planting and just one night small stage events. And it's uh, developed up there now to where we have uh, 5,000 uh, people capacity, uh, permanent approval with the council, four stages, four days, branching out into permaculture uh, workshops and um, a lot of like satellite activities, uh, visionary art. So it's been an incredible journey to be on. Um, and so where where we're up to now, I feel, um, you know, ma mainstreaming is one of the the themes that I'm kind of interested in because uh, it's going from this very underground, hidden, uh, you know, it all started in pre pre Facebook days. Internet was still, f you know, fairly new phenomenon, and now it's everything so public, and you know, we're dealing with influx of interest and of of people who maybe haven't had a a long history with the culture, and uh, so it's a really interesting time. So both both intentionally. Uh, taking that message and that culture to a broader audience, but also dealing with uh, an influx of new media attention and and new um, uh, yeah new people uh, drawn to it and, and experiencing it. So it's a it's a really interesting time in terms of all these things intersecting and and some new pressures uh, being created around that. The concept of mainstreaming, I think, is going to be a really interesting one for us to discuss because, uh, as Michael was saying a couple of minutes ago before we we came up here. He was uh, his um, experience goes back to some of the the really early festivals, which were um, in some ways extremely underground. But in other ways, there's been a, a, a long history in Australia of quite mainstream festivals, and of course, we still have a number of mainstream festivals underway. So, at some point a little later, I'd I'd like to sort of address that. Um, are we? It, is there a sort of a crossing of the paths? Um, in terms of, is there a crossing of the paths in terms of us going from the underground to the mainstream and in fact how far has the mainstream gone underground as well? But Tim. D don't cross the streams, <laughs> that's what they said, isn't it? Um, my name's Tim Harvey, uh, so yeah, my history, I sort of started going out to uh, festivals in 96. Um, by the end of the 90s I was involved with a, a Melbourne group called Transplant, which were doing tree plantings uh, and parties. 
and then uh, involved in another couple of uh, production crews. And then around about 2005, I got involved with Rainbow Serpent Festival. And for the past 11 or 12 years, I've been the marketing communications guy there. Um, so yeah, gee, and where, where have we come from and to? We've come from a guy called Andy doing our first aid, who was a lovely guy <laughs> back in the day, to nowadays having a complex that is made up of so many different service providers uh, and different amazing people who are all sort of doing their own bit to try and provide a safe environment for people to come and enjoy themselves over the Australia Day long weekend. Oop, not Australia Day anymore, just the long weekend in January. Um, and uh, yeah, where, where we're at and where we're going, it's, it's I think Paul's right, we're at an interesting transition stage. Um, definitely uh, got some strategies with how we're moving forward as an organisation. Um, it's uh, obviously a, a difficult situation to be in when you have sort of like a, an obligation to your patrons, an obligation to your stakeholders, and an obligation to, you know, the festival directors as well. So it's, it's an interesting situation to be in, but hold out hope that it's going to work out well. <coughs> That's pretty much what I am and who I am and what I do. All right, thank you. Uh, I think you touched on a, a, a point that's come to mind now, which is sort of the, the concept of proactivity versus reactivity and to what mm. degree uh, is it in, in incumbent upon us to um, really to try and anticipate uh, trends in particular in terms of the response of stakeholders and the broader community um, and to what degree can we anticipate and then to what degree can we mitigate uh, against those. What, what, to what degree you can also shape you know, yep. prior to. Yep. That's yep. the other thing Great, that's thanks. We might touch on that a little later too. Michael, welcome. So Michael Balderstone from Nimbin Mardi Gras, really, that got me here. <coughs> but he, he's right, I went to the early Bread Bow and Down to Earth festivals outside Canberra. They were fantastic events. Like 10,000 people in the middle of nowhere, everyone camped. There were no fuck all rules and regulations. What sort of years were these? That's Michael? why it was so... I can't what? remember the oh. years. <laughs> I absolutely have no idea. Roughly, how, roughly how far back? <laughs> 70s? Yeah. 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 So so 40 years ago. Probably. Yep. Yep. Jim Cairns, p politics was involved. And, and it was all cool. And ever since then, I think, you know... Now I think insurance companies have got everyone by the balls. And that's what's <laughs> running the gig. <laughs> and it's changed. So Mardi Gras, we're up to 25 years. Which is pretty tragic when you consider the um, lack of law change, because it totally started out as a protest, and against the cannabis laws and the you know endless helicopter raids in Nimbin and so on. And Nimbin's been collecting cannabis users kind of for, you know for probably nearly forty years now. So it's a unique community. Long-term cannabis users, I realise now, are all medical users. We're using it for a reason, you know. People are starting to believe that. We were mad, you know, not long ago. Any, anyway, you know, the festival started off as this protest and it got so popular, the police started getting involved. And, the, you know, it was really the media, the media talking about, you know, all these photos of uh, our mate Murdoch, photos of people smoking weed and totally screaming headlines in Sydney. So we even got to the riot squad at one point and I was just saying before, the riot squad came, and, you know, they came from Sydney with big black cars and water cannons and horses and dogs. And on the Sunday, we have this sort of three-day event now, by the Sunday, half the cops had their jackets off and just about marched with us. So th they were good moments, but on the whole, relations with police have gone downhill because it's just the rules and regulations have taken over. And the cops have had their own... Royal Commissions, they're scared not to do the right thing. You lose your job, you've got a mortgage, you know the game, the whole thing. So interesting to talk about it. We've used lots of different <coughs> tactics to try to, to um, keep fest our... our, our we can't, I can't call it a festival because then we'll have to pay for the police. We're a protest. So it's a protestable, some people said. <laughs> But we're definitely officially a protest. So, but we have to put in a DA. It's a nightmare. Camping, everything's got rules. And we're nearly strangled, except Kathleen here, who helps do the EGA, is helping us get all that together. Council. I mean, I, uh, you know, I tried to drop out. It's been a nightmare. You can't. Really. So I look forward to talking about it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you touched on, you know, obviously police responses and mm. riot squad and so on and all. Uh, and... 
the really interesting idea came to me that that's there's a correlation between that and and a little bit of the the uh, the exchange I guess between David Nichols and uh, and Rick Doblin last night about um, the I guess the the cure of the curing of people's attitudes in terms of um, once say military ex military personnel have gone through a psychedelic psychotherapeutic treatment is their worldview so fundamentally changed that they can't go back to what they were doing before? And if you're saying that there's been, you know, there's been any number of pe people in law enforcement over the years who have ended up with their shirts off and sort of just about joining, in some ways is this a positive exposure for them from our point of view in that they, c they may have more trouble going back to their daily day jobs Absolutely. and their triplicate, um, you know, all the paperwork and shit Absolutely. that they have to deal with. Um, so in, in fact, we might be having a quite significant yeah. positive impact on their, their culture as well. That's a great idea. We might touch on that yeah. as well. Okay, Steph. Thank you, Martin. Um, my name's Steph. Uh, I coordinate Harm Reduction Victoria's DanceWise program. Um, but my connection to uh, the festival scene, for want of a better term, um, began growing up in the South Island of New Zealand um, and frequenting the bush with something that could play music. Um, and my first large-scale festival was 2001. It was called The Gathering uh, around Takaka Hill. Um, so I've always uh, had a passion for the outdoors, uh, dance floors, I consider them spaces where you can let go and heal and make connections with loved ones. So um, that is quite a separate, that started off quite separate from what I considered my professional life, uh, the public sphere, the way that I related to um, my work. I studied law and I was interested in uh, community services and human rights more broadly. And it wasn't until I went to New York City um, and I had uh, just a few months there and I did an internship in Washington Heights in Manhattan. And that was at a needle and syringe program. So I became specifically aware of harm reduction as a strategy, um, a way of interacting with people who use drugs, um, accepting people um, and their bodily autonomy, and just uh, promoting uh, health and harm reduction education and pragmatic strategies to reduce the risk of harm from drug use. Um, and what I found, so I, I, after New York, I moved to Melbourne. Melbourne was a place that I would come, I've been here for six years now, but uh, I had been coming over for the five years prior for some of the festivals over the summer. So, and I had uh, quite a friendship circle here. So I definitely felt the pull here. And it wasn't until um, I met people who volunteered with DanceWise that I realized there was an opportunity to, to fuse my love of um, music in the outdoors and uh, human rights and harm reduction. Uh, so I continue to just practice as a volunteer at a community law center. Uh, so I get to see two kind of sides of uh, what people might experience, or more than that, but uh, two distinct sides of what people might experience uh, with the increase in police attention at these kinds of gatherings. Um, I see that some people are maybe um, experimenting with psychedelics or other drugs I at these festivals and having a distressing time and needing some kind of support and whether that's within a designated safe space like what the dance size chill tent is or within uh, their open-minded friendship circles and the campsites of um, people like yourselves who frequent these events um, and I also find people that maybe had a wonderful time at the festival didn't require any distinct services that were provided but they um, maybe attracted police attention for really low level offences and then they get referred to community law centres. They're not eligible for legal aid because of severe funding cuts to legal aid over the last year, few years. Uh, and they are then having to deal with the implications <coughs> beyond the festival world uh, with employment and travel opportunities. So yeah, looking forward to exploring those themes a bit more. Shane, thanks for joining us, welcome. Um, yeah, my name's Shane Russell. Um, I um, am a director of a festival in New South Wales, near Canberra, called Dragon Dreaming. Um, I uh, 
basically got 10 years experience um, with these sort of events. I sort of ju jumped into the deep end. I went to my first bush party in 2007. The second party I ever went to was one I put on with some friends and then the first festival I ever went to was actually Dragon Dreaming when I put that on. So um, I, I didn't have a lot of prior experience. Um, but I've, I've worked quite, ex quite extensively with these events now over the last 10 years. I've site managed events like Strawberry Fields Festival and Regrowth Festival in New South Wales. And uh, I've worked with festivals up in Queensland all over the, all, all over the country, quite frankly. And um, <clears throat> the thing that I have actually been noticing with events is um, the things that were mentioned a bit earlier is that um, these events are definitely becoming more mainstream. Um, they're becoming more accessible to people. And um, one of the things that's um, really significant as they become more mainstream, as the age demographic for these events are falling quite r rapidly. So um, the age demographic for Dragon Dreaming um, eight years ago was approximately an average age of the patrons would have been about 30, 31, 32. The average age for Dragon Dreaming now is down to about 22. Um, you work at events like Strawberry Fields Festival and the average age of Strawberry Fields Festival is 19. So you, you, you're dealing with 9,000 19 year olds. Um, schoolies. Why this? Hmm? Big schoolies, by the sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, schoolies. Yeah. Um, um, I, I often use the ex, um, often use the expression babysitting um, because it it actually gets like that occasionally. Um, the thing that I've been noticing um, as these events have been uh, moving in the mainstream and the age demographics is falling is that the um, the, the level of risk. Um, involved and the um, risky behaviour from patrons is increasing. Um, th they don't have experience with substances and they're taking substances in enormous amounts and they don't know how to deal with the outcomes of this. And so the, um, the necessity for us as organisers to actually um, um, look at ways to care for these people is increasing as a result of that. Um. Yeah, I think the aspect of substance use is definitely something that we're going to be covering, obviously, in the context of, yeah. of this event, um, and a very good point to make, and, and how it relates to risk and risky behaviour, and then how we create safe spaces on both sides of the fence to protect people from others as well as themselves, and also to protect others from them. So there, there are several levels that we can explore that uh, as time goes on. Uh, it seems to me that um, the general feeling is that we're in a less good situation now than we might have been five or ten years ago. Is that a bit of a consensus? Would anybody say we're in a better better place in terms of, yep? Is it better in the sense that more people are thinking about the potential that you, you can grow within yep. such spaces? Are we in a better place because there is more responsibility accepted by organisers to... Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I, to, to be honest, I, I do think we're in a better place. I, I think um, the level of a responsibility I'm seeing from organisers these days is um, increased dramatically on what it was um, when I first started operating 10 years ago. And um, the um, this, um, it, it has to be a good thing. Um, the other thing too is that, um, you know, culturally, um, you know, we got into um, these sort of events because we wanted to share our culture with people and as they are moving into the mainstream, it is de definitely um, um, resulting in problems, but you've also got the benefit that you actually are getting the opportunity to share the culture that you wanted to share with more people, which is which is an excellent thing. Yep, yep, yep. Um, we're in a, well, uh, would you say that there are major differences between um, drug festivals and, or, or I guess, let's try again, <laughs> forms of electronic dance music festivals which Thank are you. commonly <laughs> associated with drug use um, and more traditional perhaps uh, acoustic or rock music festivals which are le probably less commonly associated with drug use in the public's perception but in fact are still very much associated with drug use. So do you think there's a perceptional problem there and how could we address that? Or do we need to address it and how do we do that? It's not just music festivals as well. Like it's Absolutely. It's like Spring Racing Carnival, AFL Grand Final, like anywhere where groups of people congregate, there's going to be a certain number of people that take Well, drugs. I think that brings us to the, the drugs of choice of certain, certain cohorts of, of festival or event attendees. So I'd say there's a very different um, drug of choice at the, at the race, the Spring Carnival races, for example, apart from alcohol. Um, compared with, <laughs> uh, 
compared with, say, Rainbow or any of the festivals we're talking about along, along the table here. Um, but also I suspect there might have been a, quite a shift in the, the, the drug use patterns um, in events from original small Bushdorfs, which are probably more purely psychedelic festivals, to, um, you know, to, to, to much larger festivals where you do have a much broader range of people and their backgrounds coming on board, age groups, uh, experiential backgrounds and so on. And so where do we... Um, how do we do we have to demarcate among them? How do we do that? Do we because one of my major concerns um, that you may not share is that the word drug is a shocking a shocking term because it just it carries so much baggage and it, it, it's such a broad catch-all term. So how would you how do you feel about this sort of perception of drugs as a concept and and do we need to try and pick that out and try and deconvolute it? So uh, the biggest drama, the biggest drama for Mardi Gras has always been alcohol. <coughs> so we really tried to, and we've got the pub in the middle of town. If you haven't been to Nimbin, it's a one street village, and the pub's in the middle of town. One pub, nine cops, and the whole one street's live to the cop shop. So, so, and they're still overrun by people selling weed and buying weed, wanting to smoke weed. But, uh, but, but Mardi Gras alcohol. We've had to, we've got a no glass policy, and the cops came down quite hard on it. And the cops now focus on tipping alcohol out in the street because it's a no alcohol, a no alcohol zone. We went through a, a kind of Saturday night dance party thing that happened also, which was meant as a safe place for people because they closed down our music at midnight. Where does everyone go? They needed somewhere to go. That was a drama. But then it brought in all all the other. You know, non-cannabis drugs, which the police see differently, and blah, blah. and we had a few dramas because it was all unregulated. So, so I'm sure it's true that now we've got so many rules, it's good. But we, the biggest danger is getting busted, as far as I'm concerned. So our efforts been to try to keep the police at bay. So we formed our 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 own polite service. So we didn't need the cops. That was important, and we've got a jungle patrol we created. So we didn't need the cops. And we've kind of, you know, mostly won. So we do our own security and they stay back now. Yeah. And that's critical because the big drama is people, you know, getting busted. There'll be an odd overdose of people who don't listen to the cookie advice. So we've got safe spaces for them. But otherwise, you know, the cops are the drama. And I'm mm. all for we change to the polite service and uh, they hardly see you coming. <laughs> The, 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 the comment that you made uh, <laughs> earlier about um, uh, changing or demarcation between the, the word word drugs um, is an interesting one because um, the general public don't associate alcohol as a drug, mm. but um, unfortunately it is. Uh, essentially, Australians in general culturally um, associate um, going out and having a good time with taking some sort of substance would be alcohol or something else. So yes, um, changing the perception of this is this type of substance and this is this, that type of substance is fairly important, I think. I think, well, sorry, so putting the pressure back on them as well. Like one of my things this year that I just keep on, basically every rainbow comes along and I have this rotating sort of like dialogue in my head, which is how do I defend, how do I defend, how do I defend? And one of the things I've come up with this year is, like, you've created this situation, oh, legislators and, and law enforcement. Like, you know, back when I started at Rainbow Serpent Festival, we weren't dealing with any of this shit that we're dealing with today. And the, the whole reason that we're dealing with it today is because of failed policy over, like, 20 to 30 years. And then they expect us to solve it within a five-day period that we have these people in our, in our gates. And it's like, you know, get real. Have a, have a little bit of uh, common sense here. You've created this incredible problem. You've made people invent more weird and wacky and inventive, like, chemical substances to try and, and you know, get around laws. And then you turn around and put the pressure on us to try and solve a situation within a five-day period. It's, it's just insanity at, the, at base. You know? I actually had an interesting um, statement from the police a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago um, because we just actually just finished Dragon Dreaming a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they actually complained to us that uh, there was a higher level of alcohol intoxication at the event this year than they'd witnessed in the past and there were some associated problems <coughs> as a result of it. Um, and my comment to them was is that you, know, you guys have been um, telling us to push the message that yeah. you know, we don't want uh, illicit substances at our event and the message is getting through and this is the result. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, deciding um, this substance or this substance or this substance is um, different at different levels is incorrect. Mm. It, it, all, all substances should be considered the same as far as um, you know um, being consumed in a public place because they all have problems. 
And if we're, if we're going to be perceiving issues related to drugs, um, we, I would recommend we always go back to set, setting and substance. You know, it's not helpful uh, to demonize, uh, to point out and demonize certain substances over others, because uh, another lens would be to say that certain people shouldn't have drugs because maybe they're predisposed to being weak. So you, you want to uh, make sure that the, the mainstream narrative about this issue is a bit more nuanced and you're considering always set, setting, and substance. And setting uh, can be as small as the individual chill space that someone is being supported in to the entire society that is subject to our drug policies. So you're saying that education is quite an important part of the process. Thanks. So do you think maybe education of politicians, lawmakers, and law enforcers might be useful as well? It would, but I, I think that the majority do know what's right. It's just they're a little bit of a slave to the ballot a lot of the time. One of the things we're doing this year is we're, um, we're working to de develop a policy. Uh, it's, just, it's just crazy, but you know you have to do these things when you have a m mound of documentation like that. So we're developing a policy and we're actually going to go and we're going to start grassroots education of our council. Um, of locals, we're going to create a, a you know direct community consultation, communication, and hopefully with the aid of people like Caldecott and Monica Barrett and experts who have just got this fantastic evidence of what's working overseas, we're going to start at grassroots and we're going to change council's mind. We're going to get council on board. They're going to we're going to get them to understand how important it is to support our view. Hopefully, and you know we're just going to we're going to take it with a step at a time from there. So great. The point Talking that the just talking alcohol, Splendor in the Grass is main sponsors are all alcohol companies now. Yeah. And I see that heaps at all these music festivals. It's legal, legal, it's the legal drug. Cool. Um, the point that I really push when I'm communicating with our stakeholders, and that could be police, media, um, local community, um, council, is really just to separate the idea of the festival with the idea of behaviour at the festival because... You know, there, there is this um, perception or dialogue that festivals are, you know, somehow promoting or inciting this kind of behaviour, but uh, the people creating the spaces are usually focused on some really simple themes and then they just manage the behaviour that comes through. And so I look at it as basically like it's, um, it's a little snapshot, it's a tip of an iceberg of um, this really broad social problem. And sure, different types of festivals will attract different types of people and different behaviours and different substance tendencies, but there isn't this clean separation and there isn't, um, uh, you know, with festival organisers really advocating uh, the use of this, we're actually just dealing with the problem in the same way. So everything that I really, you know, put forward is... Uh, you know, don't tar us, tar us with the same brush. We're actually here to work together. We have the same goals. Mm. We need to break down that perception. And uh, it's led to some really, uh, you know, some good information sharing. Uh, interestingly, I think um, the last two years, when we look at the road stats in terms of uh, drug detections, I do get actually a breakdown of um, uh, which ones were locals. And it's usually about a third of uh, the road um, drug detections have been locals and it's been, um, you know, cannabis and, and methamphetamine and, um, you know, and we're in a country area and, um, you know, little things like that. And we've been able to get that sort of information actually put in the newspaper write-ups as well. So we're really pushing for, um, there's a lot of grey, you know, grey areas and blurred lines. Let's not, you know, but, but, but that's like a, um, it's a media, uh, you know, it's a convenient media story is these festivals promoting this thing. But yeah, we, it's something we have to constantly battle against. And um, some people are receptive to that. Excellent. I, I did want, and that's a fantastic point that uh, brings me to this idea of geographic, um, I guess, location of festivals. Um, do you feel that there are variations, geographic variations in sort of festival cultures and then uh, official responses and then peer or, or um, uh, human, uh, sorry, well, peer responses, so community responses? In other words, would a, <laughs> would a <laughs> South East Queensland <laughs> uh, <laughs> festival... It, in my mind, I've got this unstructured, unwritten uh, cultural anthropology of festivals and Again. substances and the kind of, um, you know, behaviours uh, th that it, um, you know, and that can be any anything from the music to, you know, whether it's an alcohol-sponsored festival or whether it's completely underground, you know, the intention of the people who've um, put it on, what their uh, creative background is, and it does manifest as, as different behaviours. Uh, and if you go to um, festivals in different parts of the world, um, you're going to see just it's it's like a different co uh, cultural storyline, and it's in it's an interaction of um, you know humans, 
um, external agents, uh, community, and you know, a broad cultural background. So every single time it's different. There's no set rule uh, of you know a festival is going to be like this or that. And there's so many variables that you can only ever, I guess, I guess observe. But sure, like a festival where everybody uh, you know smokes marijuana and there's no alcohol will be massively different to something where everybody's drinking Jim Bean and you know listening to country music. Or um, our, our previous site actually, um, it was uh, it was called. Um, uh, Cruiser Park, and it had its own festival called Mud Bulls and Music, <laughs> and that was um, country music, bull riding, uh, full driving, and uh, you know all the alcohol sponsors. And used to hear stories about the behaviour there, and um, and you know we we were the festival that apparently had all these risky substances, but it was just uh, it was like a security non-event. It was just people being peaceful and enjoying you know art, music, and each other. And yeah, so all all these things are definitely uh, influences. Right. Risky substances versus risky behaviours. <laughs> again, the twain shall meet. Uh, any other further comments on that? I'd like to move very soon on to safe spaces since uh, that's, that's an important part of what we were discussing. So um, what, do, what does a safe space mean to you, obviously within the context of the festival theme that we're discussing at the moment? Where does it, what is a safe space and where does it, where does it fit? Sass, I know you've got <coughs> plenty to talk about. I was hoping to just tag on. Uh, <laughs> well, you're welcome to tag question. on. Is it? Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. Talking about emergency services. Because I, I get to be a, a, a fly on the wall or, or uh, someone sitting at the table at quite a few different uh, emergency management or planning meetings. Um, and I do get to see that certain considerations where you have people like agencies like law enforcement. Um, wanting to know the proximity to the nearest hospital and what facilities and what potential um, public health implications uh, a local community could feel. Because Australia is an incredible country where you can go out um, and find yourself in such remote and exquisite places. Uh, but we have a lot of rural communities that are actually starved <coughs> for essential services on any go good, uh, given day of the year. So sometimes festivals come into a space and they're actually um, setting up a, a hospital, like um, set up, uh, and they're actually enhancing the health services available for a short period of time. But sometimes okay. if there was an incident or there, it was perceived that there was a high risk of a particular incident happening uh, in this remote setting, people would have to come up with the logistics of how, where would the helicopter land and those kind of things. So um, those factors do have an impact. Mm. Festivals might seem like, oh, it's two hours that way, it's two hours that way, but what kind of services are in that direction compared to that one can have an impact on whether someone's getting a permit. Yeah, right, okay. But mm -hmm. so if you're going to break a leg in Beaufort, then probably the January long weekend is a good time to do it. Is no. that the idea? <laughs> 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 Go on, ask stats then. <laughs> um, yeah, so good point. So, uh, sorry, Shane. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I was actually just going to continue about what, what is a safe space. Yeah, please. Um, <coughs> safe space is not necessarily the word that I'd like to use for it, um, but essentially, um, the concept for me, um, it's become very poignant to me in the last couple of years, is um, it, um, you want all of um, the people that are attending to your event to feel comfortable in whatever situation that they're in, um, you know, whether they've hurt themselves, whether they've been assaulted, whether they're intoxicated, whatever, um, to present um, to staff and the services that we've got inv available. That's essentially what safe space is. It's, it's not so much a space, it's more an education, it's more a um, get getting um, every patron um, confident enough to present to the services that you have available and also knowing where they are. That's, that's what a safe space yeah. is to me. I think that's a beautiful point because I, s I guess what you're what you're really um, saying is that the whole space should be a safe space. A and absolutely, that, and that in some yep. ways we focus maybe on creating a safe subspace. Yep. But that brings us to I know Steph's, Steph's really good point that she made during the week was that if you have a safe space, then does that mean that all other spaces are unsafe? We we call them chill out zones, right. and we'd so have, a, have it's a discrete space. Several yeah. throughout the sort of protest site yeah. and always try to have someone with medical knowledge there and people who know, m often there's overdoses of cookies or people mixing weed with alcohol or occasionally there's a bit of violence but very rarely, we, we haven't had trouble with it. But it's really important to have those zones where people can just go and be quiet 
because there's music everywhere, there's noise everywhere, whatever. People just need that chill out space. Mostly that's what they need. So it's really important to have that. And again, we try to try to make sure we can cover all those bases so police <coughs> don't have to get involved. Right. So the, the next question, does anybody want to fur explore that further, please? Because I think there's I, lots of I just to want to say that like, I, I find the concept of having a safe space at a festival, like, I, I agree, this, the whole festival should be the safe yeah. space. And then my, my other concern is it kind of sets you up for failure because it's an unattainable kind of goal to have a safe space. You can create as safe a space as you like and someone can come in and still completely destroy that just through their own actions. And this is the, this is the issue I think we have with Rainbow is that 95, 90, 99 point something percent of people are doing uh, the right thing. And I don't mean they're not taking drugs. I mean, they're taking drugs and they're being educated. They're aware of the services that we have if they get into trouble. They, they sleep, they eat. And then you have a point zero, maybe one, point zero seven percent of people who are in some way, uh, you know, self-destructive, um, not going to eat, not going to sleep, going to go hard, you know, party or die kind of attitude. No communication, um, no amount of services are going to protect you from the effects that that person can have on your business and on your community. Um, and so I find that in my head, like there's this, there's like, let's create a safe space, but then let's not kid ourselves. You know, we're, it, we can do everything that we can and we're still subjecting ourselves to that risk. So then the next question is, well, what are the, thing, the other things that we can do um, outside of that, which is basically, you know, education of the stakeholders and, and creating support structures within our stakeholder community so they have access to the same information that we have. And, that's just my view on it anyway. Yeah. For us, nice. um, we're really trying to take both a proactive and reactive approach. So what people might think of a safe space, a place to go, is more more reactive. It's when there's already a problem. And uh, part, of the, part of the solution for me as well is actually uh, proactive. So um, we have a team who actually walk around dance floors with uh, harm minimization, like top 10 points for surviving the festival well. And that could be things about contraindication or staying hydrated, looking after your mates, just really simple stuff especially focusing on the, the younger part of the audience. Um, a whole department called Cooling and Caring, which I guess is like a, a really friendly front line. You know, it's um, misting water and actually it's just set sets of eyes everywhere. So really trying to actually um, not just wait for a problem uh, to present. And so that really fits in with what was said before about trying to make the festival, the whole festival more safe because what we're actually doing is um, managing percentage risk factors. And they're all small percentage risk factors, but multiplied by five, ten. 20,000 people and then you start seeing statistics so um, yeah that's um, yeah safe spaces from both angles yep I think uh, again we've touched really nicely on an another concept which has come to me is that who are we who are we protecting in safe spaces who are we protecting from from Michael's point of view it was protecting from the police mm -hmm. from you know from from Shane's point of view I think it was protecting people who are maybe having a hard um, well, having a harder experience, and so I think we've all covered on that as well. So the people who are who are having more difficult experiences and perhaps need a quieter space. From Michael's point of view, music and music and noise are things to be protected from, as a lot of people at festivals go for the music and the noise. So, you know, there, there are several ways to look at that, of course. So, um, yeah, to 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 what degree should we be sort of trying to define what safe spaces are protecting us from and then how do we go how do we go from there i mean yes a chill space is a fantastic concept that we all i'm sure we all embrace and maybe that could be considered an even safer space than the the broader safe space of the of the facility in general does that make sense the other thing we have is is jungle patrol which again was to try to keep police or authorities at bay so they're walking around all the time to to because people come to nim and they don't know the place directions People get too stoned, whatever. Mental illness is a big attraction. We seem to bring them like a magnet. So, so that's an end, and we get volunteers to do that over yeah. Mardi Gras. So this is the ranger concept, I guess. Uh, yeah, that, that yeah. We constantly all are walking quite around with. the water bottle, like you're talking yep. about, yep. just trying to help people. And the rovers and dancewise yeah. steps. Yeah, so and again, yeah. to do, we've got they do traffic control as well. So again, it's just to try to do try to do everything ourselves rather than bring in outside bodies. Also because it's been a, we don't have the finances, you don't get much funding for protesting against government laws and you don't get much support from the government either, really. <laughs> um, so who should be creating these safe spaces? Because I know in, in actuality there's a range of 
responsibilities taken by different organisations. So, of course, festival organisers on the one hand. I mean, a, a, a chill space is, is a concept that's that's come about, I guess, well, it's come about in the indoor, the club scene, as much as it did in the, in the outdoor scene. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, for example, a, a 50 or 100 person Bushdorf is probably not going to have a chill it, it'll have its own chill uh, spaces which are basically people's cars yeah, um, so. and so <laughs> uh, and under pillows and that sort of thing so um, yeah that that comes into play but of course then you have non um, organizer organizations such as such as Dancewise Harm Reduction Victoria and then there's a number of others as well so um, is it a matter of sharing responsibility for these or is it a matter of um, each uh, each organisation making what contribution it can, and then um, hoping that the others will uh, will step in to cover other dimensions of that sort of safety that we've been talking about. Um, um, well, I would advocate uh, that the harm reduction perspective is very horizontal. Um, harm reduction education is not a trickling down effect; uh, it's a two way plus conversation. So uh, one of the key values for harm reduction is that you empower people. Uh, so it would be making sure that you don't overtake. So if you are um, setting the intention to create a safe space or a chill space, it has to be authentic and it's going to work best when it's working with the direct community that it's there for. So yeah, mm. it always mm. has to be a collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Children is big in safe spaces, uh -huh. and, and children have always been a challenge to me because I you want kids to come. I want them to learn about weed early, you know. Don't smoke with tobacco. <laughs> anyway, one of the biggest dramas I've found with kids is they get left. So you've got someone to look after kids, and it gets to sunset, and there's still eight kids left. Where are the parents? Mm -hmm. So children are quite a challenge, and, and it's really important. You've got spaces for kids and parents who want to look after kids, and... It's a big part of, of so anything we've done. So is that, um, sorry, just touching on that, and I think Tim's going to be able to talk to that in a moment as well, is that um, uh, to what degree is community abrogating the responsibility for, 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 for safe D <laughs> and safe creating safe, safe spaces, <laughs> you know? Um, if, if the festival organisers are expected to provide a childcare facility, you know, how far does the responsibility go and, where, and where, where do we stop? And what you start enabling people then, you know, if you're yeah. not careful. It's, 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 very, it's, it's very tricky. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, yeah, well, I think we do need to take that into consideration. Um, but yeah. um, the point that Steph said about um, um, uh, harm minimisation being horizontal, well, um, safe space is horizontal as well because the, the point that I made earlier is um, you need to educate your entire patron base um, to look after each other and need them to be aware um, that services exist and they're not just taking responsibility for themselves, they're taking responsibility for every single person around them and one of the things that I've actually noticed is that, um, as the age demographic has fallen, you see a lot more instances of somebody lying on the ground hurt for whatever reason and people looking at them and going, oh, and wandering past. And, and that's the behaviour that we basically have to try and educate our patrons is not acceptable. Um, basically, um, patrons' um, safety is everybody's responsibility. Um, yeah. In, in fairness, I, I'd say it's working as well. Like, I, I think it's the, the difficulty we have is that, you know, and I'm sure, like, Steph can probably say whether this is the case or not because she's so closely related to what happens at Rainbow. But people do bring other people in. Like the, the amount of community involvement over the last five years or three, two years would probably be, uh, I'd like to see the graph. I think it would be a pretty big upswing. Mm -hmm. The issue is it only takes one person. Like this is, this is the problem. Like you t one person ends up you know, dying or being transported to hospital and that's all it takes before the whole house of cards just come crashing down on top of you and you know, police are firing that same question so they ignore all of the good that's happening and all of the community involvement and the and the you know the don't be a bystander and the peer education and they focus on the one thing that's not working but i, I would say that it's working we we have um had a look at our data over the last three years and what we've noticed is yes the number of presentations at a range of events has increased quite steadily um, but that's a good thing in the sense that people are more aware that the service is available to them and they might um, choose to access the service in a preventative uh, as a preventative measure what the all the data clearly showed was that the amount of time that people were in care nearly halved.
So the total number of people that presented nearly doubled and the, the total time that people required some kind of support was halved. So that's, I think that's encouraging. So are these the stats that have come through? Um, looking at work, all of the events that we've gone to and looking over the last, it was either three or five years. Yep, great. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, I mean, that's the kind of, that's the kind of data that just absolutely needs to be um, gathered, I guess you're saying, and then communicated. I mean, it's one, one thing to stick it away in a spreadsheet or, you know, and, and, yeah. and do your stats, but, uh, but then, you know, the authorities obviously need to be convinced that these safe spaces are, in, that they're Pro working. The problem is that they use that data against you as well. They potentially yep. can use that yeah. data against you. So, yep. you know, they turn to us and they say, oh, well, we've created the nest and we've created a women's safe space and we're encouraging people to come and present if they have problems with, you know, sexual misconduct or, or assault. And then, of course, the police are like, oh, well, you know, we'd love you to share our, uh, your statistics and how it goes. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the fact that we have it encourages people to come and say when something's wrong, which increases the statistics and puts you in this really awkward mm -hmm. position where you're doing the right thing for the community. The police are really interested in the stats. And if you give the police the stats, then it uh, doesn't look really good for the festival. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah. with yeah. that particular yeah. example, uh, that... Uh, the prevalence of sexual assault is an issue that uh, is everyone's responsibility, but yeah. the underreporting of sexual assault is just as prevalent and just as much of an issue. So, um, yeah, as a festival, you're more like a festival organizer, you're more vulnerable to those kind of criticisms rather than people recognizing that an increase in people feeling confident in services and reporting is progress. Uh, so, but you don't have enough time with the no. sound bites and media headlines to actually flesh out how complex some of these issues are. Well, and also that they've got an agenda, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's not like they're looking for a fair, fair reporting and fair commentary. No. They're, they're oh. looking for something that can further degrade your reputation with the community, with the general public. So that you know the pressure can be put on you. It's yeah, yeah. I, I, Tim's completely correct. I mean, we have to we have to recognise the fact that essentially the police do have an agenda against events like this. Um, can I, I also say it's not police. I think I honestly don't have a problem with the police. The police mm. have the police are, are, are non-existent. They they are there to enforce a law. They cannot say anything other than what they say. You know, you can go up to the police and they can say, look, you know, totally agree with your event, love your event. And then when, as soon as there's a media camera in front of their face, yeah, we're, we're really disappointed with the relation, mm. you know, with the, the, the you know, behaviour and all that. It's the legislators. They are, oh. they, they, are, they are enforcing what the legislators say. So for the change, you, you just got to bypass law enforcement and go straight yeah, to I, I, I agree with the legislators, but I mean, we, I, I've been dealing with superintendents in New South Wales that actually have an agenda. Yeah. I mean, these, these guys are um, at a rank where um, their job has basically become political. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, they're, yeah. they're towing a political line. And I, I've, I've had statements said to me from the police, and this is a really interesting way that they can swing things sort of like Tim was hinting at. Um, you know, they've said to me that, look, you guys need to engage us um, user pays, you need to pay for us, and the reason for that is that you don't have the capacity to keep drugs out of your event. But, but, then, but then if there is drugs in your event, it's then your fault, it's still my fault. So I've engaged them to perform a, a role, um, and they haven't successfully performed that role, and then the consequences are mine. And so right. they don't see the contradiction in those statements. Well, the trick is to get them addicted to the income stream. <laughs> <laughs> From, uh, from paying events so that ultimately they can't afford not to have the events running. I, I've had a lot to do with the police for years. You're right. It, 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 attitudes are changing, but it's really mixed. Some cops are cool and a lot aren't. And I actually think it's going to be really hard for them to admit they've been barking up the wrong tree for a long time and screwing up people's lives, not actually helping them. It's a big, big um, humbling for people. It's hard for them. Back to just a, a sort of, a, uh, it's an agnostic question, but it does touch on the, um, your mention of, of the nest and so on and, and what we touched on there. Should, should safe spaces be inclusive or should they be exclusive, demarcated, in other words, gender-based or should they be children only or like to what degree is that, you know, sort of a, a good thing? Could it be refined? What are your thoughts on that, please? <laughs> <I> lean forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think that... All, all of the um, designated safe spaces you just listed, they have the potential to be valid uh, so long as that is an authentic fit uh, for that particular setting. Um, and kind of like how you have a risk register, which is a living document, you know, you have to, you have to 
consciously engage with whatever you're creating on an ongoing basis. Otherwise, you could lose touch and you could create, um, you know, a, a segregated space that actively discriminates or, you know, t some key populations slip through the cracks. Right. There's a lot of risks. Yep. So, yeah, you have to, on ongoing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've been uh, having this conversation um, through the Earth Frequency community uh, Facebook group at the moment and the general consensus seems to be that it, um, people believe they should be inclusive but have capabilities of offering um, specialised care. So if, um, if a, you know, a woman presents and she's going to be triggered by you know, males at that point to have the ability to provide that or if it's you know, something with children, you know, it comes down to blue cards, things like that. But the minute you start segmenting, then... Um, you're already being uh, exclusive and and then, um, y you know, ev even the gender things like, uh, um, yeah, how, how far do you go? And so it's uh, e easier and simpler to be inclusive but to, um, you know, to build be it sensitive with... Sensitive yeah, to... Exactly. to, to yeah, the funny thing is that to, to create a harmonious community, like there has to be give from both sides. I remember having this conversation a couple of years ago about cultural appro appropriation um, and... You can have people that are really offended by cultural appropriation and then you have people that really want that freedom of expression and like you, you got to try and find this balance and I remember saying to someone like you know the, the the success is somewhere in between it's it's understanding someone's right to freedom of expression and also understanding that person's um, offense that they take uh, you know a certain thing and I think within a, a safe space as well you, you it's a safe space if everyone has respect for each other and 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 then you don't need to have that division. You know, you can have that um, all-inclusive sort of space when when everyone's treating each other with a little bit of care. And I think that's the other thing that's got to be noted. Mm. Uh, one of one of the things um, that I notice within the dancewise space is how dynamic it is. Um, you and you, you've seen walls be created and taken down at any particular time. So rather than looking through the lens of gender, looking through the lens of um, what kind of um, intoxicant uh, or poly drug use is going on, uh, when we're at some events, it may be really alcohol heavy. And so um, really you're just trying to manage it so that one person vomiting isn't creating a water full of vomit <laughs> of everyone else that's grossed out in the space. Um, in, uh, in other uh, events, where there might be a more diverse range of substances or leaning towards the psychedelic. People may be introverted or extroverted, so you may be wanting to create a dark, safe space with their alone or give them the opportunity to be playing with um, some kind of psychedelic toys. So, you know, um, you would be designate like having a designated... This is for people experiencing body load symptoms, and this is an area for people who want more or less stimulus. So th the space evolves over a four-day mm -hmm. period. Brilliant. Um, and you know, once you're in the outdoors as well, uh, the the impact of the environment has uh, changes the space as well because you often have to deal with things like flooding or extreme heat. So yeah, I, I think there's definitely a um, a case for um, exclusive spaces. Um, um, for for example, if you identify a particular problem, uh, a problem that Steph mentioned earlier, uh, uh, um, reporting of sexual assault, for example, and if you decide that that's a problem, um, creating an exclusive space to try and um, increase um, the um, comfort of a patron who's been assaulted to to report that, that that's definitely um, something that should be investigated. Um, I, I think it. Ex uh, it doesn't take away the need to have a very inclusive space, but um, yeah, investigating um, spaces set up to deal with specific problems is definitely something that um, you know should be done from time to time. I think yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Oh uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, <coughs> definitely agreeing with that. Where each space could potentially be open to the full range of people, but you know, at, a, at, at Earth Frequency we have. Uh, one space and most of these have actually filtered through the community where there's a group of people with uh, an area of interest and some qualifications but one's totally focused on psychic emergencies that's what they do and another one is focused on general harm minimization and uh, the sexual uh, assault and then there's obviously medical so there are you know segments with specialized capabilities but each one of those is open to anyone it's not like oh, only only women can come in here Okay, in the next three minutes, I'd just like to cover three, three points um, and I would dearly love to open it up to questions since, uh, since we've, uh, we've um, covered a lot of ground and I think we've planted a lot of seeds. So please have some questions ready for us when we, when we fire up. 
Um, the first was, um, could a pill testing or drug checking zone be considered a safe space in a festival? Could. Mm. <laughs> um, the second was, and this touches on Paul's mention of the Earth Frequency community and what's probably an online, I assume, forum or so on. How about a grassroots uh, safe space movement and to what degree could that start to supplant the um, the uh, responsibility of organisers and uh, third party organisations to actually foster um, safe spaces and then third um, and then for, well, how about we just cover that that one that one concerns me personally because I think there's a whole heap of bu bureaucratical requirements so if something goes wrong in that space and it's grassroots and it doesn't have that kind of control but again Steph you're going to be better off to comment on that I, it scares me a little bit <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you and, um, perhaps I shouldn't tell you we had a group that wanted to come and present a safe space at Rainbow <coughs> and um, and I had this big discussion with a guy and he, he comes from a, a very religious background and it, it has a very religious tone to it incredible religious tone like you know jesus is our savior kind of tone and we want to come and, and exercise the demons from people who are um taken lsd and and have let something into them and i remember saying to the guy look with all due respect you know we, we we're just not religious based it's it, we're not going to let any group come here representing any religion and try and do that and he said to me like i'm not religious and, and I, rem I remember just thinking, well, this conversation is probably not going to be very valuable taking any further because we're not even on the same mm, ground here. Mm, and that's the that. kind of thing that s scares me. Like, you mm. let something in and, and you lose control, mm. and then who the hell knows what you're letting happen to your patrons. I, I, I guess what I was trying to say was that um, do you think there could be just the encouragement of a greater sense of safety and safe spaces w within the broader community, within the community? Um, and that, that it should be, it, it could be encouraged to be a spontaneous movement, not, not to be a formal space created by somebody within a festival environment. I guess I was just trying to say, can we start to shift the responsibility for safety back on the community itself? And so, you know, campsites could have their own little safe space, and they probably do. It's often the car, as I said, but it's often, um, you know, it's, it's a part I of their site. I think that does happen, like the pendulum kind of swings. Yeah. Like, Dancewise, formerly Rave Safe, was a grassroots movement. Um, we still, uh, primarily volunteer based but it was uh, like just individuals uh on their own volition setting up a campsite but with the intention of it being designated for anyone that needed support mm. for their drug experience and then it evolved to become a government funded program mm. and now um we don't have the capacity to go to all of the events that may um, seek our service but we can offer training so that people are more empowered we do drug related first aid we do trip sitting um, trainings and so people are more empowered to set up their own establishments um, and we refer people to lots of the online resources like the psychedelic handbook which is like a how-to guide to set up your own chill space so yeah yep. both. cool I think, um, the, um, I, think, I, think, I think the organic DIY approach has a lot of value for small events especially because what you're looking at in our budgetary terms to organize these spaces well uh, is you know one of these spaces yeah. might be the same budget as the entire small event and yeah. so the DIY self-managing approach is it's really important and then all of these uh, smaller you know sub communities of what might be seen as the festival culture uh, bring a, a higher level of education to the larger events so right. I think it, um, and that's where a lot of the um, al although we uh, have it as officially structured parts of the event a lot of it has come from people in the in the community doing that kind of work saying your event needs this and it's the right time and it and then it gets integrated cool uh michael final word yeah just well, quickly the, so the polite service and jungle patrol we use are all volunteers and what's really and sometimes we get trouble in them like you say you'll get someone who you know presents well and turns into a power tripper the uniform goes to their head you know but it's really important, people come back regularly. If they have a good time, it's important for us they have a good time, they're there for five days or whatever, and they come back next year. And I, I really depend on them lots, people who keep coming back, they get the hang of it, they know what they've got to do, yeah. and they love it. You've yeah. got to enjoy yeah. it. Enjoying it is the trip. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'll just make um, just one final throwaway line, but we maybe could incorporate that into the next 15 minutes to a little more of, of question and answer was, um, to what degree do you feel that festivals are a microcosm of the broader community and so could, could, um, could model 
safe spaces be sort of broadened to the wider communitarian community context? To what degree do safe spaces have a place in, in the broader community? But I'll leave that as a, just a little food for thought, as, um, as much as you'd love to comment on it, I'm sure. Um, in fact, while, while the first question's coming up, why, don't, why doesn't one of you have a stab at that one, if you'd like to? Is that the local neighbourhood centre? Yeah, yeah. Could well be, the drop-in centre. So they board. exist, but I think they're, they're a fairly sort of like vanilla kind of approach that, yeah. that yeah. we've got in Western society to doing that. And it would, yeah, I think it would be cool. Festivals to me have always been an opportunity to model what we'd like to see in the world. Yeah. So I think uh, every we yeah. should always look at what we're doing as what, what's relevant, what could be filtered through. Yeah, I like that. Thanks very much. Mm. Fantastic. And thanks very much for your, for your talk so far, um, or contribution so far. First question, please, from the floor. Um, thanks for talking, guys. It's been really cool to hear you talk about um, these large-scale festivals of this kind of environment. I, I guess the question is, where does the idea of an event that is self-sufficient start and stop um, for each of you in terms of numbers? Well, we're actually working in a venue that's uh, limited to 5,000, um, you know, plus or minus a few percent. So we've had to design all of our systems around that. But even at that scale, um, we're so in the public eye you know, we, we have to collaborate with every possible layer of authorities, regulations, all that sort of thing. And I, I began my journey with very much a DIY approach. And, and um, I guess what I saw was that I was encountering, encountering certain difficulties and sometimes it was about, uh, you know, there's this dynamic tension between, you know, available budget and your resources and capabilities and, and the risk factors. And the, the bottom line for me was that I wanted to continue to do this type of event in the most sustainable way so for me it did end up going over ground and that opens a big kettle of fish uh, you know uh, and there's um, the, the, the whole idea of staying underground and being self-managing it's it's an ideal that I've yeah I guess battled with and, and thought all the way through and it's almost uh, I, I found the the most difficult part was probably the sweet spot of where I'd like to operate because you grow to a size and then you start getting attention and we are seeing small events being shut down just as much as uh, big events getting pressure and in, in my mind it's almost come down to just super underground is so um, easy and doable like no promotion no social media and I don't know what the limit of that is it probably it depends on where uh, it's being done and how well it's being done and, and not having statistics on the radar and then completely mainstreaming and, uh, and overgrounding it um, and having everything done, you're bulletproofing it, you're making it, um, uh, yeah, basically you don't want it to be shut down, you want to have an answer for every single thing. And to me, uh, there is this sweet spot in the middle, but that's where I guess those two sets of pressures overlap. So the people who do actually pull off the 1,500, 2,000 person, that's the point I actually had the most difficulty, but that's maybe where I would have liked to stop. So um, the growth after that has actually been a response to, well, I need more capacity to deal with the kind of problems and risks and pressures that I'm facing. I guess from my experience, um, I've worked with a lot of um, smaller events like what you're talking about with weird and stuff like that. Um, there's, th th there's, there's two tipping points that I've seen as far as numbers are concerned, which basically once you hit about the 600 to 800 uh, mark, you suddenly, um, there's a next level of organisation just in, you know, facilities you need to provide, toilets, all this sort of stuff. So um, that's your first tipping point. And then the second tipping point is, is sort of the um, um, number that um, Paul was just mentioning up around 2,000, 1,500. That's sort of like the second tipping point. And that's... Um, what I mean by tipping points, it, it just means that the level of your organisation and your structure needs to upgrade to a certain uh, um, more facilities, more organisation, more people. And I've watched many events really struggle with doing that because they 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 pretty much work as volunteers. You know, they're putting it on because they like doing it. And then all of a sudden, there's a level of administration and organisation that is required at those sort of those two numbers, in my experience. Look, I would say just don't don't give up. Like grow small. I could grow small each year. Like um, if if all that's gonna if all the new people that enter into this space are gonna be 
multi-million dollar organisations that can afford to lose millions of dollars a year and, and put on massive festivals. We're going to get to this homogenisation of our festival culture. So I think it's really important that you keep faith um, and that you stay in the game and you just try and, and grow s small with support from your community and, and your people around you because it, yeah, you're the future of you know, the next rainbow and the next earth, earth frequency and stuff. So keep going. Yep. Great. We've but got just but over five minutes to go. So I'll I was I'll just going to say, but just also don't be scared of selling out an event. Um, basically set your numbers and go, this is my budget and sell the event out if it's 600. That's a mistake I see a lot of small events do is they get very excited when they're selling tickets very well and they just sell more and more and more. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, next question. Was that Eric? Is that Eric under that hat? No, sorry. Hi guys, <laughs> <laughs> strangers. Uh, no, I'm really interested in, as we've seen a, a quite a crackdown recently from authorities, we're seeing younger, inexperienced promoters come up and perhaps with the costs of creating safe spaces, the temptation to be underground from the start and cut those costs and whatnot must become all too real. So I'm interested in your views on how we as elders of the community can potentially mentor these younger crews or what we can do to limit the impact of, on us of where they may cut costs and, and cause problems for the entire community. Uh, look, we've been doing that for years. I, mean, I remember like back in the early 2000s, there was uh, a safe festivals uh, pamphlet that was devised and put out as a, a mentoring attempt to try and get people to, you know, think about different ways to make their events safe. I don't know, like, the one thing that we haven't nailed yet as an industry is we haven't come together as a really nice cohesive industry Australia-wide and I think that's the probably one of the biggest things that's holding us back in terms of the recognition that we have in, in mainstream is the fact that we can't get our shit together uh, and put the egos aside and come together as a, as a group Australia-wide and have a bit of clout as a, as a combined group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I think, it, it's really important talking to councils, I reckon, and the police, that you've got good negotiators. You've got to get on. There's no good going headbutting them because it's the council paperwork guys that can make it a nightmare for you. There's always a, um, a bit of a challenge in, I guess, being, you know, the elders, as you say, and telling the, the young ones, like, how to do their thing. You know, it's like it's uh, even at this sort of, you know, it's an industry thing and it's, it's in everybody's best interest. There's a little bit, yeah. But uh, I think um, maintaining good relations, going, going, actually taking the time to go to the emerging events, meet people, uh, and just as much, even if it's informally, just open sourcing it, just say, hey, come and talk to us anytime. It's something that I actively do and I've met a lot of amazing people by doing that, but I think, you know, stepping it up and, and thinking, well, yeah, let's download some of this knowledge, let's cr uh, create that. It sounds like there's been, uh, you know, some steps to do that, but I think we are at a time where the, the levels of pressure are increasing. It's not getting any easier, so it would definitely be in our interest to talk about things like industry associations and, um, and uh, knowledge uh, collection and all that sort of thing. Great, thanks. Final question, please. Uh, so you've discussed uh, the numbers of young people attending festivals are increasing. And as time goes on, we're also seeing increases in um, police attendance. There's you know, more roadblocks, undercover busts, uh, and uniform presence. So with this increased police presence, how are you seeing the behaviour within festivals changing? Are they making a positive difference, or is it adding more complications to the mix? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, OK, one uh, direct uh, response to police operations that I have first-hand experience with is people seeking support within the DanceWise chill space after having get, gone through a roadside operation where their vehicle was searched, where they were possibly strip searched, and that's a violation. So sometimes police operations are violating people. Um, yeah, so that, that can be one of the responses to this. I also think just in terms of the, the visual landscape and the psyche of a festival, seeing someone, irrespective of whether they have the authority to do so or not, wearing a gun is ridiculous to me. Like, ridiculous. And then a whole bunch of hivers can be frustrating as well. Uh, with that said, there's a lot of... The majority of police officers on the ground at festivals seem to be there because they're wanting to um, just manage any antisocial behaviour and they're not actively seeking out people or 
targeting individuals. On the ground level, police officers are taking a community approach, but I would rather see the people who love the scene being the community elders rather than us needing like a government agency to do it. So I've got to say saliva testing has been a nightmare for us and, and most festival goers anyway. You know, Nimbin, you know, saliva testing on the Nimbin Road, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. So we've done lots of protests and I just drive with fishermen's friends on the dashboard and milky coffee and orange juice and everything, clean your teeth. But there's no guarantees because the actual stick that they're using is just a piece of crappy stuff anyway. But if you get right through, you're gone, you know. So lots of people up our way have actually stopped smoking pot. And it's changed drug trends. There's no question. Sniffer dogs and saliva testing has changed young people's drug trends. So it's a real challenge. People have got to get really organised, I think. Driving... I mean, we have an Im a incredible record at Mardi Gras. I think there were two arrests last year, but 167 busted for driving. So it's a real issue for us and for everybody. And I think the best you can do is um, hassle your local member of parliament and say it's nothing to do with impairment. Mm. It's total crap. Mm. It's an absolute scam, you know. Until the law changes, that is the reality of the society that we're looking at. So although it's a major friction point, I think the presence uh, that, you know, I'm always looking for the positive and I think upskilling our community of how not to get busted and the yes. fact that this is something that you're going to experience in the outside world, inside events as well. Uh, and sure, there's people who are being directly affected at, at this and it is, it is a friction point, but until there is broad political change, and that's what we all want to see, um, that is the reality. And if the presence of police at a festival educates people to be discreet and to be more of a ninja and less just thinking this is an anything goes zone, then that is going to actually be beneficial for our community. Can I just add, and it's a shameless plug, like I, we're talking about peer support and you know how we're going to try and help as a community to, to improve things. Um, we, we're definitely looking for more people for the Rainbow Rangers program and I mean, when I look out at this sort of place, this is exactly prime harvesting ground. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, like if you're interested, we desperately need... We d and this is it. Like, it's one thing to be able to sit here and say, this is what we need. It's something else entirely for people out there to put their hands up and say, okay, well, I'm not going to party hard at Rainbow this year and I'm actually going to give back and I'm going to play a role. And we really need you to do that. So if you need to do... If you want to do that www.rangersupservant.net. <laughs> <laughs> there you, uh, there you go. EGA has been exposed as a, a recruitment uh, vehicle. That's for why I'm here. I'd like to thank the panel very, very much. I think we've had a fascinating hour and a quarter's discussion, and I really appreciate. And I very much appreciate your attention and your uh, questions and involvement as well. So thank you very, very much.